<laughs> Welcome everyone to another episode of the Wood from the Trees podcast. Uh, I hope you're all keeping well wherever you're watching or listening in the world. Uh, if you're liking what we're doing and you want to support the podcast, if you go to patreon.com forward slash the wood from the trees, I'm not going to say podcast <laughs> at the end of it. And for the price of a pint, you can help us grow and support the podcast. Uh, really love what we're doing, but we don't have a network behind us and we don't have sponsors. So, you know, for the price of that little pint or uh, one of those fancy venties, you can get uh, extra episodes uncensored. You won't see it anywhere else. You can get involved in the show and you can take part in it and there's prizes to be won. So I appreciate the absolute fucky. Enjoy the episode. It is now. <laughs> Belinda. Hi. How are you? I'm good, and you? I have one question to ask first. Yeah. Is it Kyo or Kiho? Kiho. I, I'm after getting caught with that a few times. I'd never thought of that. Did you never think of that? No. Yeah, I was talking to a few people and I have relations that are like, no, it's Kiho. <laughs> oh, really? Because I get slagged for for saying it that way? No, no, that's a, that's a thing. I, a bog man from Leash wouldn't say that now unless that was a thing. Yeah, Kyo is K-E-O-G-H. <laughs> and have you loads of relations that have the same... Way of pronouncing it? No. Or do some of them go, no, it's Kyo? No, the women in our family say Kyo. And the lads? My dad used to say Kyo. My dad, or my brother says Kyo. So is Kyo on notions? Um, That's no, true it's now. just the correct way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. But I, I've received um, parcels with Belinda Keyhole. Keyhole? Yeah, because I, I say my name Kyo. Ah. And they'll actually send it K-E-Y-H-O-L-E. Are you getting parcels from America? <laughs> I don't know where it was from. <laughs> because they they are very phonically driven. You know, if you say something and it's spelled, that's where they're, it's like Ron okay. Burgundy. You know, he's going to write exactly yeah, what's no, on Yeah, no, I can't it. remember where it was from. So you're a Wexford person. I am. Thanks for the t-shirt. No problem. Apologising for the drama with the car. <laughs> <laughs> should have bought a Merc. Should have bought a Merc. I should have bought a Merc. I fucked up. <laughs> uh, where are you from in Wexford? place called Blackwater. It's a seaside village. If you've heard of Curraclough, most people yeah. have heard of Curraclough. Yeah, we next, used to go there. Yeah, next village to there. My so family you, are from Blackwater. <laughs> really? Yeah, well, some family, yeah. Oh. Fortunes. Yeah, I know some fortunes. Yeah, I can't think of their first names. Rough old crowd, are they? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't hang with fucking crowds like that, though. <laughs> so you grew up beside the sea? Yeah, can't swim. Really? Mm -hmm. So that whole living beside the sea, no one's out surfing, no one's out fucking... No, no. Mm. Surfing wasn't really a thing back then. And uh, probably on the East Coast, surfing is not such a thing anyway. What about waterboarding? No. <laughs> That's a torture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's actually a torture method. <laughs> I didn't, I only, I watched too many films. What's uh, the thing he did with Alan Clark? What? Supping. Supping. Is that, yeah, I think it's called supping. I don't know, the paddleboard, isn't it? Paddleboard, no, paddle, no, it is, it is S-U-P, yeah, yeah, but I don't know what that. Yeah, I don't know what it is either. You stand on this big board and you're kind of. Is that mm. a paddleboard, no? It could be. Look. I live in Leash, the only county in Ireland not touching the county, touching the sea. True. Okay. Yeah, so, you know. Uh, big family? No. Uh, one brother, one sister. Baby? Yeah. Uh, how would I know that? <laughs> I have no idea. Were you spoiled? Yes. Um, what was it like growing up? Um, they were older and they went off to boarding school when I was maybe seven or eight. So I always felt like an they only child. You. They no, just you. like an only child. So you were like on your own. They must have been a little bit older than you, a nice bit. Five, six years. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you're young, that's a yeah. A good so bit. Did yeah. you go to boarding school? Yeah. Did you like it? Um, I had a lot of fun, but I I've always kind of had a bit of a problem with being told what to do. So uh, I got asked to leave. What boarding school was it? Uh, the Holy Faith Convent. Convent. Yeah, yeah, with the nuns. So, so there was you a, were arguing with nuns. I was arguing with the principal, who was a nun. That's disrespectful to Jesus and the education system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was just, you know, it was so strict, you know, it was, there was, it was just stupid like what? stuff. Typical day? I Like, for instance, I was brought into the principal's office for whistling because ladies don't whistle. Stop. Yeah, things like that. Typical day, um, I think, was up at 8 o'clock, down for breakfast, or 8.15, we were called at, down for breakfast at 9. Um... School started at half nine, I think. Um, school day, then you had an hour in the evening and then into study from, I think, was it half five? 
to quarter past six, tea time till seven, rosary every evening except... Full rosary? Yeah, except Wednesdays, I think we had um, mass every Wednesday. Back into study until 20 past eight, 10 minute break, back into study till half nine. You got one shower break a week. So I think that was 15 minutes that you're scheduled to go leave study to have a shower. No way. Um, other than that, you just got up early in the morning to shower. And was there nuns just walking around everywhere? There wasn't a lot of nuns there. It was predominantly lay teachers when I was there. So we had a principal that was a nun. We had maybe one teacher um, and then the rest of the nuns were in the convent. So we didn't see them a huge amount. And did they beat religion in tea? Was no. it... No? No. And I don't know what was in the water in 77, 78, but my year, all of us were, most of us were kind of wild. So a lot of us actually didn't finish there. Um, left either asked to leave or moved school or... Yeah. You were asked to leave? I was asked to leave. Did they ask you or ring your parents? Um, No, they rang my parents, I imagine. I can't remember. What was, what happened? Nothing. And everyone asks me that and everyone Come laughs when they say it. I'm not buying it. Like just caught smoking loads of times. and But I was very, um, it was the first time I learned to look someone in the eye was there. And it was that principle. She just. You just had enough. Yeah. Um, and I was it? always trying to get out. I was always like in the winter, if it was lashing rain, you'd be out in your sports nicks and little t-shirt trying to get the flu to get out for a week or. I got hit by a nun actually once. Actually, that was another nun that was there. And she hit me and I thought, brilliant, Where? this is it. She was over our dorms. So in first year, I was put, sorry, when I was in second year, I was put back in the first year dorm so that you were closer to the matron. And that was a nun. And she came in one night and my friend from downstairs was out of her bed and up with me. And she sent her back down. And she, but she hit me and uh, I was thrilled. Where'd she hit you? Think in the arm. Like Just a, a swipe. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have to talk when you should have been listening. Um, I sound like I'm just saying, no, I'm innocent all the time here. But I, 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 I don't know. I can't remember. Maybe, maybe I stood up to her. I can't remember. But she had hit another girl before. And I remember telling my mom and my mom said, if that ever happens to you, make sure to tell me. So I was thrilled. You rang the next couldn't day. Get home, couldn't get downstairs to the phone quick enough. And uh, rang home, dad answered. And I said, and I was pretending to be really upset. And mm. he said, I said, dad, Sister Bernadine was her name. Sister Bernadine hit me last night. And he said, well, what were you doing? And I was like, put mommy on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and she said the same thing, but she still, she rang and she came down after, to them. So I think it was just that we were very much, um, weren't afraid to, my, my mom and dad would have been the same. They weren't afraid to, stand up not in an argumentative way but just this is not right this is not good enough um but I didn't get out at that stage so it was the middle of fifth year I don't think there was anything really like major that I did at that time but it was just loads of little stuff looking back now do you think uh born school is very hard on kids or is it good for them I don't think you know any different because, you know, going from primary to secondary is a big change anyway. It's a big school. There's loads more kids there. So you don't know any different and you're all arriving in. All these first years are arriving in together. So you don't know any different. Did you not miss your in, parents? Um, Probably. No, we got home every weekend. In hindsight now, I would think that uh, we wouldn't be close, my brother and sister and I, because we all went to boarding school. Hmm. And my sister left the year I went in. She was finished. So we were apart for all those years. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in that way. You don't way, build the connections with your 100%, siblings. Yeah. And maybe because you're away for school, you don't build connections in your local Area. village. Yeah. Yeah. So when you left for doing nothing wrong. <laughs> yeah. Asked to leave. <laughs> for just, just being you. Uh, where, where did you go to school? Where did you get in? My unbeknownst to me, my mum had gone to Loretto and Wexford during the summer between third and fifth year and tried to get me in there, but they were full to capacity and couldn't take me. So she had to go in and beg. So I was in there. I got in. And I was there two weeks, I think, and I got suspended. Ah, stop. And why did people not accept you? No, I had stuff written back then. I don't know if he had this. If you got in trouble, they used to say, bring your diary. And they used to yeah. get, sign the diary. We had a diary as well. 
so I had loads of stuff written in the diary that was they didn't like. And then I probably gave some back chat and got suspended. And that's when I really thought, I'm I'm in big trouble now. My dad hit the roof. Yeah. We, did you like, were you good in school? Um, Academically, were you good? I had no interest. I had no interest. Like, I had great fun, great crack. Didn't care? I'd, didn't care. Did not care. No. And then uh, finished school. And... Uh, I thought when I finished school that I remember I had this friend that had left school after uh, junior cert and she got the dole when she got to 18, I presume. So she was a little bit older than me and she had money every weekend to buy cider, buy fags and go to the disco. The dream and when, I, you're, when you're 18. And I'm going, sure, that makes total sense. I can't wait to finish this school thing so that I can do that. And I, I literally thought that was it once I finished school. I'm going to get the doll, I'm going to sit on the bridge in Blackwater and smoke facts. <laughs> and my parents can't tell me what to do anymore. And then all my friends were talking about going to college and going to Dublin. So I wanted to go to Dublin then. And uh, my mum suggested beauty therapy and I didn't care what I did. Your mum su- suggested that? Yeah. Why? Were you into beauty? and? No, I was like into biker rallies at this stage. So I was complete not interested in makeup or anything. And just as you said biker rallies, a motorbike just went past. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you were in, how did you get into that? Um, a girl that I became friends with in my second secondary school in Loretto. Uh, through her, actually. Uh, her boyfriend had a bike. So we used to go to all the rallies. At 15, 16. Your father and mother not go fucking mad. They didn't know. Didn't tell him? No. No. This is like one of them 80s films. You're that unruly girl. Um, they didn't know. So, um, yeah. It's crazy when I think back. And when I look at my own nieces, you know, and I think if they were heading off, you know, we were two girls heading off with like 10, 12 lads to bike. On rallies. bikes? <laughs> On the back of a bike or in the back of a car. Actually, no, I remember going down on the train to Waterford. There was one in Kilmeadon, you know, Kilmeadon. It's the Phil Cheddar, seemingly. Yeah. So there was the, one of the biggest rallies in Ireland was there. We used to go to that. Like Sturges in Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, you left school, you're 18 years of age, you're into bikes, going out, all you want to do is drink. Yeah. Have fun, like yeah. no, normal. Yeah. And your mother goes, uh, I think you should be a beautician. Yeah. And you go, look, whatever, man. Yeah, I didn't care. So off I went. To Dublin? Yeah. And the girl that I was friends with in school that was into the bikers, the the bikes, not the bikers, of course. Um, And the bikers. And the bikers. Um, She was studying equine therapy and I was doing beauty therapy. So the two of us lived together and every morning walking down the road, she'd be in a pair of jodhpurs, a pair of riding boots with a bag on her back and a a whip sticking up out the top and I was in like a white dress like a nurse's yeah. <laughs> dress and the navy card again and yeah sight for sore eyes so when you went in to do your first day in that course what was the name of that place Bromwyn Conroy and you were there look I'm just I'm just here or did you go as oh, rebel- this is actually interesting yeah no as rebellious as I always was I always liked to do things right so when I was there um I, yeah, Concentrate. I, I'd be quite an anxious person, believe it or not. So I, yeah, I would have been very anxious. So therefore would want to do well. Yeah. And did you enjoy it? Did you fall in love with it? Um, no, I didn't. Um, made, it was, um, Bronwyn Conroy. I don't know if you ever heard of her. She would have been, um, very well known back in the day. So it was a private college. And it was probably the top beauty college in Ireland to go to back then. And um, it was, there was girls there that came from very moneyed backgrounds. So like a girl came to me one of the first days and first question, not what's your name, where are you from? What's your father do for a living? First question. She was from Holt. Oh my God. Yeah. So. Who do you come from? And my dad had businesses. But what he did for a living was he drove a forklift every day. And I said to her, he drives a forklift. And she turned on her heel and walked away. Wow. Yeah. What a cunt. <laughs> yeah. So it was, but there is like, like I, I made uh, my best friend now is from Kerry. We we met there. Um, so, 
you know, they they weren't all like that, but there were a few. Yeah. But you were there thinking, oh, I'm I'm in a fucking snake pit here. Yeah, I just didn't fit in. Yeah. And you finished that out. How many years was that? One year. But you were living up in Dublin. I was living in Dublin. Living your best life. Yeah, had a ball. Um, and then it came to getting a job. And I looking back, I think it was pure lack of confidence. But I, um, I was telling my parents that I was looking for a job, but I wasn't. Do you remember that girl? Um, she was an English nanny over in America, and there was a big trial. And the child, the child died. The baby died. Matthew Epen, I think, was his name. And that trial was on TV, and I was lying in bed in my <laughs> bed every day, watching that for weeks. Going, ring my parents, going, "Yeah, I had an interview today," and. No, I didn't get it because I have no experience. And so eventually my mum got me a job in Wexford. I mean, they had to keep on pushing me. Fair pushing me. And, uh, they were looking after their baby, you see. Got the job, went down to Wexford, wasn't happy to be home, stayed down for six months, got work experience and went back to Dublin. And uh, I was up for five years, I think. Then. You got a job, obviously, up in Dublin. Yeah. You had your confidence then, you just went in and... I was just determined to get back up. Yeah, didn't want to be in Wexford. So back to Dublin and uh, yeah, got a job, loved it. Uh, Good money? No, it was £100 a week back then and then commission. And your commission was 5% on sales, 10% on treatments. And my rent in Harl's Cross, I was had a room and I was sharing an apartment. And I think that was 60 Um so, wow. so your money was like maybe one thirty, one forty a week, yeah. Fuck. Yeah, that was tight. So a lot of people would have left beauty therapy even after qualifying. They didn't stay because the money was so bad back then. Yeah. And so how long uh, did you do that for? Stay in Dublin. Yeah. Well, like in that job. I was in that job. I think two years and uh, loved it. We do you know Roddy Bolins? Roddy Bolins. No. It's a real country pub in Rathmines, so I worked next door to that. So we used to work till nine o'clock at night and go to Roddy Bolins. And from there we'd go to Coppers and from there we go to Leeson Street in our uniforms. And then if you're working till nine, you didn't start till one the next day. So that was... Oh, oh that was perfect for you. That, that happened a lot, yeah. And then I got a job in the city centre and uh, with a... It was probably the biggest chain of, salon, chain of salons in Ireland at the time called Buttercups. I uh, worked for them. I wasn't there that awfully long and I got a managerial position in one of theirs. And uh, yeah, loved it. Loved it. And yeah. that that was a hairdresser's? No, a beauty salon. Beauty salon. Yeah. And when you're a manager of a beauty salon, what, you're just managing all the girls coming in now or bookings or... Um, bookings, you're managing the staff, but I was doing treatments full time as well. It was only like that salon that I was in was small. It was at the back of Stevens Green. Um, so yeah, I was doing treatments full time as well. Yeah. And what did you do then? I, um, was in, when I was in Dublin, I met a guy, um, when I was 21, actually 22, 21, 22, that kind of age. He was a male man and met him and that was bad and stayed with him on and off till I was 30 but oh. I had moved home in the meantime was actually in a car crash why was it bad a uh, very abusive really abusive um mentally or physically mm, not like he, he didn't hit me but uh he would have like one night grabbed me up by the throat a lot of drinking he, he, um, there was a lot of drinking and, uh, like one time we were away, uh, somewhere and we had a row and we we're in his Jeep and he drove like crazy and, uh, to a pier and I'll never forget the look on it. I'll, I'll, I can see it still like just his veins bulging in his neck and literally frothing at the mouth. He was going to drive the two of us off the pier. So it would have been more stuff like that than uh, very controlling. Um, I remember being away another night in a hotel in Cork and he made me sleep on the floor. Um, lot, just loads. 
another time we were living together actually in Wexford and he locked me in the bedroom upstairs and he was gonna set fire to the house and Fuck. yeah mad mad stuff when when that kind of stuff is happening do you tell anyone or do you keep it to yourself or friends or anyone in fairness to my parents because I think a lot of people would it's very hard obviously to watch your loved one go through that and I think for parents it must be you know to they played it very well because they they didn't exclude him towards if they had excluded him they would have excluded me and then I wouldn't have communicated so mm. um yeah yeah so they and like what, what made you think I have I can't do this. I'm not, I have enough like me with, yeah, with him in that relationship um I was out in Dublin on a Saturday night with my sister so I wouldn't have been really when I say aloud it wouldn't have been worth um, going out with my friends not the hassle yeah just yeah yeah he would just yeah it, there'd be so many questions asked and it would just take the goodness out of it so my sister had asked me to go out and uh, with two of her friends and uh, so I went to Dublin I was staying in her house she had a small child at the time so she was heading home early and I stayed out with her friends so the next day he said to me you know did you have a late night and I said no no I was home um, cause again, it wasn't worth, you know, I said, yeah. oh, I went home with my sister and, uh, he said, well, I'll, I will know. And we were living together at this stage and he was working in Dublin and, uh, we were living in Wexford and he said, well, I'll know if you're lying to me. So at this stage, like there was an awful lot leading up to this, but at this stage, I literally thought, was he, did he have someone follow me when I was up there or was he? you know, was he paying people to keep an eye on me or like I had no clue. But when I left the nightclub that night, we were in a nightclub in Temple Bar and there was this, it was under, under the, under downstairs mm. basement. So when we were coming up, um, there was a load of people at the top and uh, I went one way and the girls went the other way. So I rang them because I lost them in the crowd, rang them. And it was probably half two in the morning. So, um, on the Monday morning, I was at home and he was gone to work and he rang me. It was about 10 o'clock and he said, whose number is 086-825, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I have no idea. And he said, well, you should know because you rang at a half two on Saturday night, Sunday morning. So I hung up the phone and at that stage I was like, I was like, is the phone, has he the phone bugged? And to say I'm so bad with technology, useless, still am, hate it. And uh, he, I rang my mom and she lived just down the road and she came up and I, I wouldn't even, like I, I left the house, I left the phone in the house and she rang a friend of hers. So he said the only way is, it, is he accessing Belinda's bills and I had, the, all my posts was going to my home house, my parents' house. So it wasn't that. So as it turned out, he had set up an account with Vodafone, my account, online. So I didn't even possess an email address at the time. So he must have waited till I went to bed. Because you know the way when you mm. try to, they send you code to your phone? He must have got my phone and uh, set it up. So he was able to watch all my calls and texts. That is super creepy. So that's when I uh, left. But even when I look back, you know, <laughs> when I was saying about him threatening to set the house on fire, like you just go straight into survival mode. And uh, I remember that time, like I had a rabbit hutch and it was like a two story rabbit hutch. So it was about the same height as the table. Yeah. And like you go into MacGyver mode of how am I going to, OK, he's going to set the house on fire. So I can hear him downstairs throwing stuff around the place, being crazy. And I'm upstairs so calm, really calm, going, right, if I tie the sheets together, I'll be able to time to the headboard and just get out the window upstairs or maybe if I just dangle from the windowsill upstairs the rabbit hutch is underneath sure there's probably no you know major gap between the, the two so it's amazing how you just go into survival mode yeah yeah and was he your first boyfriend first real boyfriend yeah first real yeah so did that make you hate men um no no but when you're in the middle of all that are you thinking god men are cons? Like, I love this lab. God, they're all dicks. Or are, are you thinking, no, that I am actually, this is not right. This is very weird. 
it's mad, like, because I'm such a different person now. I feel like that was a different person that I was, mm. you know, it's like going, that's hard to believe even that that happened or that I stayed. That's the, you know, if anytime I tell that story, people just go, I can't believe because I don't, I don't take a whole lot of shit off people. But everyone grows into different people all the time. So true. Yeah. Um, but y- yeah, it's, it's hard to, um, no, I suppose like I, I, I knew it wasn't right. I knew it wasn't right. I knew that didn't happen in my brother's house or in my parents' house or, you know, so I knew that wasn't right. And at the same time, in inverted commas, I thought I could change him, you know, the age old. And was he okay with letting that just go? No, (laughs) no. Um, So we broke up. I moved out that day. I packed everything up that day when he was at work. So when he came home from work, he... um, when he came home from work, I was gone. And actually, we had two dogs together. That was another thing that happened a couple of months before I left. Um, there were puppies. And I remember one day he was in the pub and he came back and he was after losing his wallet. And you never knew, knew who was going to come home from the pub, you mm. know, angry or happy. or. But he couldn't. He had a motorbike and he was after coming back up from the pub on the bike. And uh, he couldn't find his wallet and he just lost it. And uh, he's just started trashing the place looking for his wallet. But I'll never forget the two dogs went behind me, you know, in fear. And that I just remember that day, go imagine if that was kids. Imagine having kids with him yeah. and in this, living in this fear. So it wasn't long after that I, um, that I left. So no, he didn't uh, take it well. And um, he used to ring my, I had a beauty salon at that stage. And he used to ring the work phone. And he threatened, he was like, he was on You're his own. Yeah. And he was on his way down from Dublin from work and he was going to burn me out of the place. And he was going to, so I used to cancel, I was terrified. So I used to cancel my clients and go home, petrified. So then I um, had to call the guards. My, my um, a friend of mine actually was the local sergeant. Well, I became friends with him when he was the sergeant. And it was him that really, he sat in front of me, came to the house and he said, I don't want to be the one to ring your parents someday and tell them that their daughter is dead. And that, that really got me. So that was, yeah, I didn't, is it a pulse system? I think they yeah. have it. So I had a number. He was on that and I had a number that if he well, threatened when, me. When you told me. them all those things happened, did they go to him? Did they ring him? Does, was no. there no one that said, you can't Unl- do this? I think unless you, no, because that's not up to the guards to do that. It has to be very, I look, I don't know exactly the way it is, but I think you have to be willing to go to, to take out a barn order or a protection order. Um, and I was probably too scared really to do that. Yeah. So instead he said, look, we can, we can do this so that if that happens, you have this number it's on file. So if you ring the guards and you give this number, they straight away can access. You don't have to be telling the story to, and they, they have know all to get the information you. there. Yeah. Yeah. That was scary. Yeah. So he hung around for a while and then he moved away. Moved back to Dublin. Yeah. Hi. Oh yeah. I had his, um, when we were together, he, he got a, he got a new Jeep and he actually put it in my name. I think because he didn't want to pay the two grand tax on it at the time. So he just changed the name of ownership. And when he took it back, um, he kept driving it through the M50 toll and wasn't paying the charges. (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) You were getting all these letters. Then I got Solicitor's letter over that and I I went to my my friend that was the sergeant and I was like, how, what do I do with this? And he was like, he said, that the, you know what you should do he was like you Take should actually no he goes you should ring the guards and report your jeep stolen and i didn't do it i wouldn't do it oh you should have done that that'd be great i know wouldn't it looking back now i'd do it but not then so um, what did you i was do too with scared the, what did you do about the tolls i actually rang the company i rang solicitor's office and they were they were just no problem gave them his name his address his phone number and that was the last i heard they were really good yeah have you ever heard from him since on and off, yeah. He contacted you? Yeah. You ignored? 
Um, no, I would have conversed with him. Um, uh, yeah, and that I still the same, the same kind of carry on, very condescending. No um, apology. No. Well, it'd be sorry. Yeah, but you did this, you know, or you were very insecure, or you, it, you know, and you're going. I might have been insecure, but there's a reason, mm. you know, and. Uh, um. Yeah, no, I don't know that he would have ever even admitted to himself. He's the kind of guy, what's that saying? House Devil Street Angel. Mm. Everyone loved him. You know, he was that guy that's in the pub all the time buying drinks. That kind of person. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And in the middle of all this, you're starting your own business. You decide to start your own business. Yeah. I actually broke up with him at the time and I started it then. That's that's when I think I yeah I was broken up from him at that time, so that was probably in my mid twenties, two thousand and four. So whatever age I was then, were you nervous starting your own business? Mm, not that I remember. No, no, I kind of have a like you know I'm doing this farming project at the moment. Mm. I tend to dive into things and think later. Um, so I'd say I don't remember being nervous. No. And how did that go? Which? The business. Um, it was grand. Um, I had had it for 10 years and it was fine. Um, when I was there, I decided to open a hair salon as well. And that didn't go so well. That's typical now because I don't know anything about hairdressing. And I was like, sure, how hard can it be? I'll just employ a couple of girls to work in it. So that didn't go well. Um, and then... When I had the salon, I trained, went back to college and trained as an acupuncturist and naturopath. Why, why did you go into, had you got into the, that kind of? I was kinda? really interested in health. So I, um, I think I've always been kind of interested in natural health. Suffered with digestive problems for years, went to the doctors, just never got any solutions. And like that. What, what kind of digestive? Like irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and... I would have went to doctors and I remember going to a consultant to get the camera down. And afterwards, I remember saying to him, you know, I've changed my diet since, you know, and I think that's making a difference. And he was like, that's rubbish. No so, way. Yeah, the diet has no impact on your digestive system. Yeah. So I, I'm not a, I'm not the biggest fan of, um, of doctors <laughs> and pharmaceutical drugs. Um, so I, yeah, went to train. As a acupuncturist and naturopath, which is someone that works with natural um, medicine and a uh, big interest in nutrition. And around that time, or it might be afterwards, I can't remember. I'm no good on timelines. Neither am I. I developed a chronic pain condition called fibromyalgia and uh, still have it, have pain every day. And uh, Where does the pain manifest? Or? Shoulders, arms, neck. Um, so yeah, it's, I've learned so much, so much from that and especially about going down the medical route because there's really, there's fibromyalgia is really, really common and especially amongst women, I think, um, there's no known cause and no known cure and it's a chronic pain condition. And funnily enough, I had a client recently tell me about, um, the new, it's called a coffin drug in Ireland. Um, have you heard of that? Mm -mm. It's a it's a drug that's given for pain, and I think it's called Lyrica. And I was oh, I have heard about that. There are so many people get addicted to that. Yeah. So I was talking to this client about the OxyContin thing in America, and she was saying, "Should we have that here now in Ireland with the coughing drug?" And I said, "What's that?" And she couldn't remember the name. And when I went home, I googled it that evening, and it's Lyrica. And I would have been prescribed that um, in uh, Black Rock Clinic. Um, by a rheumatologist to deal with the chronic pain. And I, I'm i just not willing to go down that road. I feel that if you take a pharmaceutical drug, you have to heal from that as well as mm. whatever else is going on. And I I very much believe that lifestyle causes an awful lot of these illnesses. Um, so, yeah. Our, the whole medical system in the world, in the Western world, only treats the problem when it's there. It doesn't show anyone how to stop these problems from manifesting first. It's very bad. Sure, I mean, we've seen that during COVID. There was mm. no emphasis on exercise, you know, boosting your immune system. Yeah. You know, like... Lose weight. 
It'll boost your immune system. That was like that, the first thing they should have been saying before they done anything was like, try and get healthy, try and get these vitamins in, try and get this into your diet. But they didn't. It was like take this drug. We'll give you free fries and a burger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's um, yeah. It's sure. Look, we all know it's just so corrupt. So acupuncture. Yeah, I don't practice anymore. But you obviously got it done once, and yeah. it blew your mind. I actually went to, the college was called College of Naturopathic Medicine. And I went there with the intention of studying herbal medicine. And I changed my mind and did acupuncture instead. So um, I had had it done, but it wasn't that. I don't know why. I think I liked the idea of doing a treatment because I'm used to doing treatments instead of writing, mixing up herbs and stuff. Yeah. Kind of in hindsight, I wish I had done the herbal medicine because I have more interest in that now. Yeah. And say when you do the the herbal stuff, so you move from you, the acupuncture, did you have a little place where you done that? Or like, did yeah, you? I used to do it in my salon, in the beauty salon that I had. And what else did you start doing? Um, Back then? Yeah. Well, I had the salon and then I was selling uh, natural health foods as well. That was another thing that didn't go to plan, uh, waste of money and supplements and food intolerance testing, which I still do. Um, yeah. And then I closed there in 2004 because the pain just got too bad to be doing things like massage or spray tans where my, because it's all my upper body, mm. anything with my arm up from shoulder height upwards, it's, it pains, it's uncomfortable. So I closed that in, I opened in 2004 and I closed in 2014 or Christmas 2013. So it was just was short hard? of 10 years. It was, it was hard because of my clients, because you build up a relationship with your clients. That's what made it hard, but nothing else. Um, were you, other than that, were you just happy to have it off your back? No, well, I was going to open another business. Um, Talk to me. <laughs> so I opened, I decided I was going to just do skincare, skincare and acupuncture together because most skin problems come from lifestyle and inside. Um, so I started Wexford Skin Clinic then. Um, and I started it, but I had a different name on it. Um, what was the name? Oh, it was really bad. Tell me. It was advanced skincare and acupuncture. It was very boring. Well, so was Wexford Skin Clinic, but... Wexico. Wexico. <laughs> I was going to put that on your t-shirt. <laughs> I like the t-shirt. Thank um, you so much. And uh, I started that just... I never... I don't have the ambition to have loads of staff and to have loads of businesses and that stuff doesn't interest me. Um, my thing was, I'm just going to go in and start this and see what happens. I was told not to do it. My family told me not to do it. Um, 10 years and my other business building it up and I was mad to close it and da 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 um, so I just thought I'll go in and I'll do my facials and acupuncture and see what happens and it just took off really? yeah so last year we won Salon of the Year uh, for Ireland we were I actually couldn't go to the awards but they were on in London so I sent the two girls that work with me and um, yeah we won uh, Salon of the Year and it just has been so successful. So how many have you worked for? <clears throat> Only two. So it's a nice tight. Oh God, yeah. Like at one stage I was going to, I remember one night at maybe three o'clock in the morning after a dinner dance thing that I'd been at. And I was saying to a friend of mine who's a businessman, I was saying, oh, I've been up in Gory and I was looking at another premises and, and I'd had a lot of problem, not problems, but issues around, you know, if staff member goes, we were so busy. And you're booked solid, mm -hmm. um, like half nine in the morning till half seven in the evening at that time, back to back with clients. And we were booked up three to six months in advance. That's awesome. It is, but it comes with a downside. So if someone goes out sick and you're having to cancel their clients, but then you've nowhere else to put them. Um, even, you know, like you're, I was nearly afraid to get sick. So there's a level of stress to that, which yeah, is, there is. yeah. Really stupid too, because it's facial treatments. You're not, you're not doing heart surgery, you know, ultimately, but you, you have a business to run and you don't want to piss people off as well. Um, you want to look after your clients. So 
Yeah, it was really busy. And anyway, I was telling this uh, friend of mine and he's like, what the fuck are you thinking? He was like the hardship that you're having already because when you employ, I shouldn't say this, but when you employ women, if a child is sick, generally it's the woman has to leave mm. her job to go home. So it's, you know, her job that's affected. So there was that. The girls had young kids. Mm. Um, so he was like, you know, you're so stressed out already. He said, what are you going to do if you have a staff member out in Gorey and in Wexford? You can't cover both. So that was the end of that. And in hindsight, thank God, because it's very stressful. My two girls now were great, but like one of them has gone off traveling in January. And is it the type of, um, you can't just get anyone to no. do it. Mm -mm. There's a lot of training involved, is there? Well, you train as a beauty therapist and you specialize as a skin therapist, but there's very few just skin only clinics. What's the difference? <clears throat> uh, so a skin beauty therapist. therapy does everything. So you do waxing, nails, massage, tans, um, towards we just do skin. We just so do someone comes into you and you've never seen them before and they say, look, make me younger or make me beautiful. Or are they saying, oh, look, I have this problem here and this, uh, we, we, my face aids. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> we, um, we kind of somehow have, we get a lot of problematic skin um, somehow. I think that's where my interest really lies. I, I don't like, like we're one of the few clinics that skin clinics that don't offer Botox or fillers um, because I really think they're bad for your health. I've never actually talked openly about that, but because mm. um, you'll get a lot of backlash. But um, we're very much about doing it the right way and slowly, but doing it the right way. So um, I think for, and, and it's becoming more for men now as well, where we get loads of men into the clinic as well and not just with problematic skin. Um, but it's becoming such a thing where you're, you know, people, it's to get old is bad. You know, it's, mm. it's like everyone wants to look younger. And it, it's a, it's a, why can't people age normally? It's crazy. And I, I was actually <clears throat> talking to a friend on the way up here and we were just talking about it. You know, it's like women, especially you know, they, they, they hate that they have these lines or whatever else is going on that, you know, and it's like, sure, where's the gratefulness for being here? And, you know, you see so many bad things going on and people being sick and we're worried about a few lines on our face. Mm. That's not a good thing from no. a skin clinic owner, no. but I love, like, I love smile lines and I love, I, I don't know why anyone would want to freeze smile lines with Botox. I think it's just the, the whole media and everything has everyone thinking that you should look a certain way. It's actually crazy. That people follow a trend of how they should look. Yeah. Like it's, it's mental. This, like this real orange skin thing. Where did that come from? Yeah. Like people are going to look back in, women are going to look back in 20 years and go, what is going on with my eyebrows? <laughs> yeah. There's some mental eyebrows out there. I'm not saying no, that poor old Matt there, he thinks I'm leering him, he's no eyebrows. Right? That's not. I just came from a week in Liverpool. You want to talk about eyebrows? Go there. Is it bad? Oh man, it's terrible. Really? Like literally like the pencil line triangle thing. Triangle I, thing. I, I, it's I, really funny hearing men talking yeah, about yeah. it. It's, like, it's crazy because I'm, I'm, I'm married to my, I love my wife. Yeah. Oh my God, dearly, right? But every woman I've ever known, every woman I've ever known, they are not dressing up for us. Mm -hmm. 100%. Because we don't, get, it's notice them things. Yeah. Like I wouldn't notice if Vicky was, had, different things on her skin or I, I don't notice them things. So I do often wonder like, what? God, don't be changing your face. Lads don't care. They don't care. Oh yeah. Well, I, I don't, I don't think men really like it. I don't. Well, I, I mean, my male friends don't I think like it, it just looks strange. Mm. Like I know uh, a guy that's with a woman, uh, uh, he's not, well, uh, an acquaintance. He's a beautiful looking woman. She was always, and the last time I met her, I was like, oh my God, there's just lips everywhere. Yeah. And I didn't know where to look. I didn't know where to look. I was there, oh my God, I feel awkward here. I don't look up, don't look down. So I just look in the way. Like, What's wrong with you, David? <laughs> Nothing, I've seen ghosts. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. It's not good. Or if you've ever seen them dissolved, that's really scary. What, what happened? So, <clears throat> you know when you get filler? I'm not good on this, but yeah. Yeah, but it does go. Yeah. So your body takes it back in, does it? So to my knowledge, filler is hyaluronic acid, which normally is occurring in our body anyway. Um, so that's what you see in the lips. Towards Botox is to stop you frowning. Hmm. So like your forehead, in between your brows and the sides of your eyes. Um, but that's a neurotoxin. 
um, botulism. Mm. Um, so to me, it's crazy. You're injecting a neurotoxin in beside your brain and... Uh, I have a mother with dementia and I just don't think these, not that she was getting Botox, she wasn't, but I just don't think that these, uh, this Botox is going to end well. You know, they're saying it's FDA approved, but sure. Oh, there's a lot we of things about, FDA to, We all uh, know about the FDA approval yeah. thing. It's nothing they, to really they, brag they, about, you know. Like imagine they still use fluoride in the water. Or, yeah. Uh, it's mental. Yeah. And so, in your toothpastes. Toothpaste. Yeah. Yeah. But you're spitting that out. You're not cooking your food and your... Yeah, well, you're probably still swallowing some of it, I'd say. Yeah. It's actually scary. I think there's an awful lot of stuff in our food. And Do you think that our food is uh, poisonous more than anything else, or is it our environment? Um, what do you think is the worst for everyone's skin? You're just dealing with oh, skin. Oh, for their skin. Sugar? Daylight. Daylight, like... <laughs> There's a whole thing now, in skincare, they would say very much that the sun is the enemy, which is rubbish because we need, mm. we need sunlight. Especially in Ireland. Um, but I, yeah, especially in Ireland. Um, and I suppose for me with skin, it's about, I, I want my clients and I want myself to look fresh and healthy. That's, that's it. If you have lines, you have lines. Um, but I want my, I, that's, that's my emphasis. So there's a thing now where they're actually saying, so in skincare, we would say you have to put on your sunscreen every single day, all year round, because there's <clears throat> four different rays that come from the sun and then there's blue light coming from screens and that there. Does all that do anything? Your face? Phone? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm fucked. You're <laughs> fucked, definitely. What happens? Um, well, blue light will be detrimental to cellular health, seemingly. Yeah. So is UVA, UVB. So UV, you know, when you see your sunscreen, everyone says, oh, I use an SPF 50. I wouldn't use a 30. So that number just tells you how much protection you have against getting sunburned. But it doesn't tell you anything about the other rays. So UVA, we have the same strength, say, today as it is in July. Comes through the car window, comes through the clouds. Um, and that's the one that actually ages us. So if you think UVA, A for aging. Um, you have blue light from the sun and also from devices and then you have another one called infrared a so most sunscreens don't protect against them all but going back we do need sunlight and we do need to be exposed to it and even people getting up in the morning and putting on spf and putting on sunglasses and going out the door like there's nothing to signal you're blocking out that light there's nothing to signal to your brain that it's actually time to you know produce energy to it stimulates the hypothalamus in your brain to know that it's morning, that it's time to get up and go for the day. So your when your we're, circadian rhythm. Or? Absolutely, yeah. So I just think <clears throat> when you say what's the worst thing for your skin, I just think in general we're living a life that's so unnatural to how we should be living. Um, and I think it's having on health and skin a big problem. Yeah, it's mad because um, it's only in the last 50 year uh, people used to get up early in the morning mm. and midnight was midnight. Yeah. Like people were asleep from eight, nine o'clock because yeah. it was dark. Yeah. And now we just live this life where we're go, go, go. And you're sleeping for six or seven hours. Uh, you were saying your mother. Has dementia. How long? She had a stroke in 2021. Was it 21 or 22? Uh, 21. Um, but looking back, she definitely had dementia before that. Um, I'm, I'm laughing as I say it because I was reading through her phone recently in text messages and you're going, <laughs> she so, so much had dementia beforehand. Um, but then she had a stroke, so that really... Um, Pushed it on. Yeah, yeah. So she's in a nursing home now. Horrible, horrible disease, but I kind of... I, I, when I was talking to my friend this morning, actually on the way up here, um, I was just saying to her like yesterday or the day before I went to see, Friday, I went to mom and she said to me, um, oh, mom is up. Mom is here as in her mother. And I said, oh, is she? And she said, yeah. And I said, is Auntie Kitty with her? Because you have to play along with it. Like you'll stress them out if you try to say, no, nanny is dead. Um, you'll upset them. Does so she you know you? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so she said, uh, mom is here. And I said, oh, she's up for a few days. Is Katie, and Katie with her? And she says, no, no, no. And I was saying it to my friend and my friend was saying, you'd like to think that maybe, you know, maybe they are, you know, maybe her mother is with her. And 
with dementia, it's, it's a slow death. Like you're dying slowly. So I would see it as she's kind of here and she's, she's here and she's not here. So some days she's more here than others. So with regards to that, with her mom, like I'd kind of see it like, it's like, you know, maybe she is actually seen her. Maybe mm. somewhere there's that in between. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, people say, I have a kind of a strange, um, you know, a lot of people are very negative, I find, with death. And, and as you know, death is really weird mm. when you lost your dad. Um, but I think as well, we need to be really grateful for how long we've had them. My, my mom is 81. Do you know, there's yeah. people passing away and sick, so much younger. Um, so we've had her for all those years. My dad was 76. And he, I think he done really well to get to 76. How did he pass? Stroke. Yeah. Quick? Yeah. He smoked 40 a day. He, <laughs> he drank scotch seven nights a week. If he knew I was here saying that, <laughs> he'd be more More Um, He drank scotch seven nights a week. He went to the pub every night. Loved it. And he worked five and a half days a week and the other one and a half days he was either doing tractor runs playing golf or had the grandkids um didn't know what vegetable looked like he used to eat like five snack bars when he was in the pub <laughs> and put a full seven up on on top of every scotch so like he did really well to get 76 in my eyes can you remember what the last conversation you had one was with him um no funny enough Oh, I can actually. He so he was in hospital. Um, he'd gone in. He had been suffering with this um pain in his foot, and he'd had load of, loads of cardiovascular stuff. And uh, he might he was my mom was saying you need you know the usual they're like round going you need to go mm. to the doctor and he's it'll be grand and uh, he said I probably stood on an old nail down the yard. And one morning he called her and his toe was black. So she brought him to the doctor and they sent him straight to Dublin to hospital. So he had to get a stent put in. He had a blockage in his knee and he had to get a popliteal stent in. And he went down, had surgery, not a bother. Um, and he came back from surgery and he started to go, like he was, um, like when he came back from the recovery room, my brother and sister and my mom were there. And he was chatting away. He was flirting with the nurse, so we knew he was all good. <laughs> and uh, he um, he started to go downhill in the following days. I remember our cousin went to visit him, who uh, is a TD, and he was just given out to him and everything that was wrong with the country. And I was thinking, why, why does he bother going to visit dad? Mm -hmm. And we broke the news to him that day that he had to go to a rehabilitation hospital because he was laid up so long. His legs would have been very weak and he wasn't too happy about it. And uh, thankfully that day I was in Dublin on a course and I was kind of bored and I decided to leave and spend time with him instead. And he had a massive stroke that night. So the last conversation actually I think was about going to the rehabilitation and he wasn't too happy about it and yeah that night he had a massive stroke yeah did he die there and then uh we got a call about i don't know midnight or one o'clock in the morning so we went straight up but he was unconscious like he died i don't know six in the morning or something yeah was that the first person to you to died my i was very close to my granny so but i was much younger um but yeah close close yeah but like, I remember being kind of angry afterwards with people saying, oh, it's terrible. And he was so young. God, it's awful. And and my attitude was that there was a guy, you know, the way time kind of, it's hard to keep track of time when something like that happens. Mm. But there was a man died off a motorbike in Wexford. To me, it was that week, but it could have been in the months. And he was maybe 30s, 40, and he had young kids. And I just went, how lucky were we to have mm. our dad so long, you know, towards. So I think you need to, it, I know it's sad and I know it's hard, but I think you need to be grateful as well. When my mom was at home with her dementia, before she went to the nursing home, we had a Filipino lady living in the house because we were all working. Mm. And uh, t 
to see them, they've left, you know, they've, they've left their country, they've left their family, they're here to make money, um, to send back to their family, to, to make a better life there. And they're so grateful for everything. And I just, I think you have to be, I think it changes your mindset. You know, you can get bogged down. We're complaining about such small things mm. in the grand scheme of things, you know, and I suppose that's how I look at mom and dad as well. It is hard. I mean, your father was a farmer, wasn't he? No. <laughs> he wasn't? No, he was a businessman. Yeah. Yeah. So I was showing you earlier my granddad's mm. letters between the government and him. So my grandparents started the business and my dad took over it. And when he took over it in the 80s, the fuel vouchers or something came in the 80s. So he got big into fuel at that time. My granddad used to transport cattle, I think. And they had, there's lovely... um ledgers at home they had the first car in our village I think so um it was a hackney car so it's like you know the date and Mrs O'Connor Blackwater Bridge to Wexford Infirmary and then the amount in pounds shillings and pence um and uh so yeah dad took over the business and got more into fuel and now my brother has it and he's gone more into so they deal with farmers and he would have had land and had sheep, but um, <laughs> I know nothing. So, about how farming. did you get into going into farming? <laughs> so, um, I, when he died, he left me some land, and I always wanted to do something with it, but I know nothing about farming. You knew nothing about beauty either at one time. <laughs> yeah, um, and. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, this, it was funny how it happened. So I studied, um, shamanism and. How did you get into that? My ex, who's now my best friend. This uh, is now not the. Not the crazy guy. Not the crazy guy. No. Um. Just another crazy guy into shamanism. No, he wasn't into it at all, but I, I don't know how I'd come across it somewhere. And, uh, I think from being chronically ill over the years and I would have suffered a lot with mental health as well you're always going to this person and that person and healers and, you know, all <laughs> like I've done a lot of stuff. And uh, I came across shamanism and I wanted to learn more about it. When you came across it, is that one of the things that worked for you? It's the best thing I ever did. So your first time going to a shaman? So my first time, my first experience of shamanism was doing a weekend course of introduction to shamanism. Where was that? A place called Dunderry Park in County Meath. I want to do it so bad. I want to do an ayahuasca trip. They don't do ayahuasca oh, there. Fuck it. Yeah. I want that so bad. Yeah. What do they do? Is Brett work? Is Brett work and uh, journeying to the drum. Um, yeah, I did holotropic breath work there as well, which is. Was it in uh, sauna? No. Where is it? You're talking about Sweat Lodge? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's different. Tell me the difference. Um, well, tell me about the first one first, the breathwork one. You're all in a tent or something, is it? No, a breathwork one we did, I did in Dunderry Park. So it's a huge room. You know, like the old dormitory yeah. in this building. So big, it's a huge, big old house. In a group? In a group, maybe, I don't know how many were on it, maybe 30 people. So you have your Anamkara. So you go and you, you meet someone and you decide to work together. So you basically... I suppose in shamanism and you know what, I'm not qualified enough to be talking about this, so I can only give my little yeah, yeah. um bit you but can only um, piss with the, the Mickey you have. <laughs> <laughs> so uh um like when you walked in when I walked into the room, like there's mattresses on the floor, there's a seat, a small stool beside each mattress, there's a pillow on the mattress, there's an eye mask, and there's a basin. For puking. For puking. Mm. And um, so people get to that level just through breath. So on the day, I was like, as I said, I'm quite anxious. So I was like, I want to do it first, get it over and done with. And uh, the music is extremely loud, really, really loud, like trance music. And uh, you're lying on the floor on the mattress. Your Anamkara is on your left um, beside you. Your eyes are covered. And your basin is there should you need it. And um, very soon into it, I could, uh, you're, you're doing this breathing. And uh, very soon into it, like the next thing I'm hearing somebody 
screaming, like screeching, like really, like a really scared screech. And you're lying on this mattress, obviously, with your eyes covered. So I always think if you're somewhere and you hear a screech somewhere in a busy area, your first thing to do is look and your Mm. second is to fucking run. Run. You can't do either. (laughs) So you're there trying to concentrate on your breath. Um, So it was, it was, I can't, I don't know that I let myself go enough during that experience to really benefit from it. But when I sat, and I think it was the afternoon then we swapped over, or it was the next day, I can't remember. But when I sat and I watched it, it's actually amazing to watch. It's amazing because there's people there that are trained in holotropic breathwork to assist people. So you don't want to stop someone. It's like if someone is crying, we all automatically go, oh, here's a tissue, stop crying. Mm. Through our own discomfort. It's the worst thing you can do because when they're crying, they're releasing. So to stop someone crying, you should you need to sit with them. And that's the same with the breath work. It's what they were doing when somebody might be distressed. They might get down on the mattress with the person and hold them, but not stop the process. They were trained to to hold them in a supportive way, but not stop the process. Um, It was really beautiful, actually, to watch. Um, Yeah. And the other one? (laughs) Sweat Lodge. Yeah. Um, So I did a sweat lodge on a women's only weekend. And this is my only experience again of Sweat Lodge. Um, I have told a few people this and I, I think it's kind of a more extreme version of it. So 30 women naked in the middle of the day getting into this, uh, again, probably a little bit taller than the table. And I remember like the they'd said, is anybody like claustrophobic or anything? And I was like, yeah, me, I'm really claustrophobic. So I wanted to be near the door. So everybody's going in. So sorry, that morning we would have went out to the field. There's all these stones there. You pick your stone, you put your intention into the stone. There's a fire and they put your stone in the fire. So the stone is heating up in that fire for, I don't know how many hours, six hours or something. And, uh, When we went back then in the afternoon to go into the sweat lodge, you come down, you're going in naked. So it's... um, Why why naked? Well, it's really hot in there, number one. Why naked? I suppose you're really getting in touch with nature. Um, I'm not uncomfortable with everyone there. I don't want anyone looking at me genitals. It's dark, number one. Um, It's dark when you're in there. It's not dark in the field when you're going in, though. So... uh, I suppose when everybody's in the same, it's like going into boarding school when you're all in the same position. Um, yeah, anyway, so we went in and they closed the door. Um, so they put layers over it and there's these stones are in the middle. So it's quite warm. But I'd heard stories of if you can't breathe, if it gets really tight for oxygen in there, you turn over, you lie down and you put your 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 face to the ground and you move the soil to get oxygen from the soil when it gets hard to breathe. So I was really nervous doing this. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so the first, um, you, you have no concept of time. So the first. But are you breathing? Like are, is someone. You're just breathing normally. Normally, mm-hmm. and is is there a shaman there or someone there just saying, right, just sit there, relax, chill out? Um, yeah, there was a lady with us, and um, she there there would have been different conversations, and one thing that would have been talked about in it was keening. You know what keening is? So you know when you see maybe travelers when they lose someone that dies, and and the women will really scream out their tears, so they're getting that grief out. So that's called keening. And you see, you know, when you see in in foreign countries where, um, especially maybe Eastern countries, where something terrible has happened, where the women will be actually keening, wailing. So it's a very healthy thing to do. But we're so, what's the word? Just don't want anyone thinking that we're mad. Yeah, or just like you can't show emotion. You can't, you know, so, so you bottle it up. Um, so Keening was actually banned in Ireland by Pope, whoever. I might have that wrong now. Um, uh, so she was talking about the art of Keening. So she encouraged everybody to start Keening. So all I was thinking when I'm in this uh, sweat lodge is 
if there's a farmer in the field next door so and there's this crowd of banshees. <laughs> yeah. And then like after whatever length of time we were going to take a break. And, and did you start? Everyone shouting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I skipped over that. Everyone's screaming. Screeching. It's very releasing. Is it? Yeah. You should try it. And uh so we uh after so long they break and that's they encourage you that if you need to pee, you pee where you're sitting. In Stop it. So this is what I'm talking about with being an extreme that one. Is it, that is extreme. Yeah. So anyway, and then they opened you... the door and so if you wanted to go out for air or to pee. So again, I'm going back to the farmer in the field next door. This is all I'm thinking is <laughs> if there's a farmer in the field next door, he's seen these women pour out his tent, go over, squat in the grass and then back in. But we had been in, I didn't realize, I think an hour and a half for that first round. So we went back in and the lady that was over it said, there's there's too much air, there's too much heat escaping, cover the door more. And there's more stones brought in at that stage. So each round there's more stones brought in. So when we went back in that time, it was way warmer. It was really hot, um, very uncomfortable. Your eyes are burning, you know, to breathe in, it's it's hot, like it's burning. Your nose hairs feel like they're burning. You're putting your hands over your face to try and stop that heat, but it mm. makes it worse. And then there was actually two ladies either side of me went down for to the clay for oxygen. Um, and when they when they turned, they were uh, larger ladies. And when they turned, they were, they turned their back to me, but so their bums came out across, so I couldn't move. I got stuck. Brilliant. And uh, after about I don't know, I don't know, three quarters of an hour maybe, there was a girl across the way in the darkness. I hear this voice, and she just said. Very calmly, she said, I'm having a panic attack. I have to leave. <laughs> and the lady over it went, no, you know, you got to breathe through it. You got to breathe through it. You got to sit with it and you got to breathe through it. And that's, I suppose, what these things are all about is, is sitting with it and breathing through it and overcoming stuff. And she just said, I need you to take me seriously and listen to me and respect me. I need to get out of here. And the lady over it just said, right, if there's anyone else who wants to go go now because the door is not opening again and I went and I was delighted to go yeah just wasn't your scene so um no I don't think that you need to um go through that level of it is fairly torturous so sorry just on the keen and David yeah so the tradition died out in Ireland in the 1950s as the powers that be and the Irish Irish church deemed the practice often regarded as a pagan ritual as inappropriate mm -hmm. and families began to fear that if they engaged in keening their family at the family members wake they would appear backward and in a backward society and thinking culture there you go so what how did so you decide then to become a shaman no no like or what does that mean that you're you do it or you have studied it um i think the one thing that i learned from going to dunderry park is that we're always paying other people to fix us Mm. You know, if if you're mentally unwell or if you're physically unwell or whatever, but you very much have that power within. But we're we're never ever told that. We're never we're kind of taught that we have to go to someone else. You know, the healer or the the Reiki person or the whatever it may be. And shamanism teaches you that you have that power within. So I would have gone to Martin Duffy, the man that facilitates those courses and that runs Dunderry Park. Maybe twice a year. Um, he he was a psychiatric nurse originally. Re you'd love him. You would love to get him on. Uh, like, he'd be brilliant here. I think I've messaged him a few times. I'll have to give out to him. Give out to him. And uh, he then trained as a psychotherapist and then trained as a shaman and, and traveled all over the world and trained with different indigenous tribes. Um, so he'd be probably able to tell you all about the ayahuasca and that. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I would have gone to him maybe twice a year, um, when I would feel. And do you know, or do you get to a different state of consciousness now when you do those things? Yeah, definitely. Like in, in shamanism, how they teach up there would be that you journey, um, to the lower world or to the upper world and you meet your power animals, you've heard of power animals. Mm. So it's, I mean, I remember the first time we did it, like, and, and Martin Duffy was saying to us, like, you'll think it's just your imagination. 
but just trust the process. And you do and you go. Can you explain the first time that something? So the first time, first time I did that. So the first time that you went, oh, holy shit, this is. It's just stuff comes up that just makes sense. And weirdly, the so I did the introductory to shamanism. And then the following year, 2016, I did the shamanic practitioners course. And it was four weekends over the year. And I had my biggest fear in life was my dad dying. My biggest, that was my biggest fear. And I think in the July in 2016, one of the weekends was about um, death and dying. And I did that that weekend. And he died in August. He died like a few weeks later from what, from what I remember. Again, timelines aren't good. But I think that's where as well my... Um, like that, having done that course just was brilliant for me. Bef- just and then it prepared you totally. Yeah, like I was so calm when he was dying. You know, it was I would have thought that I'd be, I wouldn't have coped. But I was. And are just you so a calm, calm person now? No. Yes and no. I'll be calm in big situations. If you're to ask Brendan <laughs> uh, from Fear Via Farm, he'll say no because I'm ringing him for the last two weeks. Having mini breakdowns over What do you have farm. mini breakdowns over mostly? Um, I suppose um, not being able to do everything that I want to do and getting different opinions like this farming thing now. I'm getting so many opinions on it. Brendan keeps saying, just it's okay. There's no problem. Too big. We'll get it sorted. Because when you're trying to do something different, uh, I don't know if people are uncomfortable with it or... Oh, people are always uncomfortable when you do something different. That's just human nature. Yeah, but it's I. it never bothered me before, but I suppose this time is I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm quite openly going, I haven't a clue. Um, and I'm so eager for knowledge. Um, but people just give you the scary stuff, the, the worst case scenario. Um, and that's that stresses me out a lot. Or I'm doing building work at home at the moment and oh my God. And the home place? Yeah. Just opinions, opinions. And, and all, no offence to men. I know you asked me earlier was I a man hater, but every man is an expert. But they all say the complete opposite things. So they're all so convinced and I go, oh yeah, that's that's a good point. And then someone else comes along and says the complete opposite. These are builders? It could be a guy, yeah. Different tradesmen. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone has different opinions. Yeah, but they're so opposite. And then you're in the middle going, oh my God, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Who to believe? You have too many options. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And do you not have like, this is how I want it to look, do it like this? It's even things like I'm getting gates put up and some people will say, get the electric box in the, gr- the box in the ground. And then other people say, no, don't do that because you're better putting the arm on the back of the gate. And everyone has a good argument for their point. So I'm like, I don't know which one to go for. Yeah. Oh, well, I think everyone, it, that's like for everyone. I, have, I went in to buy a laptop just for to have a tom. Right? Oh, yeah. All I had to do was buy a laptop. I'm like you, technology. As I told you this morning, I recorded a two-hour podcast <laughs> yeah. on Friday and it has no sound. That's a problem, right? Yeah. But I went to buy a laptop and I just said, I need a laptop for doing stuff at home. Uh, do you need a Wi-Fi card? Uh, has it got this? Has it got that? I said, it just fucking, it needs to have two USB ports. That's yeah. all it needs. What the fuck is a Wi-Fi card? I don't know. He started telling me about uh, laptops that have different Wi-Fi cards. And I was there, I just need it to have two USB ports. That's it. I don't care about anything. It's just for at home. Mm-hmm. Two days, two different times I had to go. And I just went, just give me that one. Just give me that one. <laughs> and did I get going? No, no I didn't. I had to try... 12 o'clock at night, I was getting fucking video messages. I wanted to say, I have a limited company now, right? Yeah. I, I can attest to this. No, I can. We were here for a long time. Doing All it. I was trying to do was set up my business online bank. Oh. That's all. Like the account's right? already set up and all. Set up. The account's there. There's money going into it. Can I get? No. Can I see what's in it? No. I can't get into it. Who I can't get into it. Bank of Ireland. Oh, I'm AIB. So yeah, I'm the same. It's easy with yeah. the AIB. It's so complicated. You have to set up users. You have to set up administrations. I put in 
<laughs> I put in because I was trying to settle my boss man. <laughs> I thought you were on about the individual usernames. Boss man was the group. Yeah, yeah. Boss man was the group. What was the individual? The, David goes, in, I was like, you need to set up as an individual user. And he was just like, grand. And I was like, it has to be like five letters or whatever way it worked out. And he was like, grand. DC sex. <laughs> like, okay. I don't know what to do. And I have to do things that I remember because I, I just can't remember anything like so that. Then my yes, username I'm... automatically became in as MKSX. <laughs> so now I have to go to the bank with this laptop <laughs> and say, can you fix this for me? Who's you? Who's DC sex? Yeah. Who's MKSX? So it looks like I'm running some fucking yeah, yeah, set ring or something. <laughs> I, hate, I hate technology and stuff. Same, can't do it. So... Who's running your business when you're doing all that? Doing all what? Building houses, run, trying I to am. get a farm going. Well, I have two staff there and they're great. Um, yeah, and I'm around. And are you um, constantly trying to manage your condition? And- um, I take on too much and the condition I think is really driven by stress. And overwhelm and basically that my nervous system is just overwhelmed a lot. So every now and again, I have to just totally have a day or two where I try to do nothing, which I find really. What do you call doing nothing? Lying on the couch watching Netflix. What's your favorite program? Well, last night I was watching Biggest Little Farm. What's that? It's about this couple in America that... um, didn't have any farm background, but they set up a farm, basically. Do you have a thing now that you want to be a farmer? Retire? Not do the... Retire? Yeah, retire. On farming? No. Like, yeah, but like, you <laughs> must have your money made at this time. I'm only 46. That's retiring age for a woman like you. Really? Oh, yeah. Business winning awards in London. You have a fucking <laughs> med. I see in the car you're driving. <laughs> I'd say you, you, you arrive with the new car and the staff are there. Oh, God, Belinda, that's a lovely car. It's really nice. <laughs> And then you say to him, listen, if you work hard and you fucking put in the work, I'll buy another one next year. <laughs> <laughs> we had that conversation over, um, I was saying to you, because my dad dealt with farmers mm. and uh, the rows at home, because he always drove Mercedes. Um, and if he was going to collect money, because their business would work on credit, um, the rows at home, because he wouldn't bring his car. Bring and, an old one. And dad would be like, our mom would be like, you worked so hard for that and you're never here and you work 15 hours a day and blah, 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 blah. You should be able to drive your car. And he's like, never get money if I drive that car into Clever the man. Yard. He was managing perception <laughs> even back then. Yeah. It's all about that. <laughs> and did you ever have any other health issues? Um, suffered really bad mental health. And at 15, um, I was actually sent to a psychiatrist. And... Uh, I was put on medication, antidepressants, for f- 20 years, 15, 35, on and off. And um, I, in hindsight, don't think that I was depressed. I think I was uh, frustrated. Um, yeah, frustrated and probably, yeah, I think frustrated and overwhelmed and I don't think I was depressed, but it came out as tears. So I think, like, I remember my mom brought me to the doctor and it was a doctor referred me to a psychiatrist. So that was the start of, yeah, 20 years on and off as a say of antidepressants. And then at 35, I remember really clearly one morning I was getting ready for work and I just wasn't feeling good. I wasn't in a good place. And I remember just thinking I'm going to have to give in. And because I'd had the experience with, with doctors and the the uh, irritable bowel, like digestive mm. stuff, to me it was given in. I was like, I don't want to take this stuff. So I was obviously off it at the time. I, I would have been on and off. And uh, then I just, I remember really clearly going, no, there has to be something else going on here. And uh, really, I think I, I, I started down a road of functional medicine um, testing. So when we go to the doctor and get a blood test, they will measure your bloods of when something goes wrong. You know, like you were saying, they, mm. they treat the symptoms. So uh, functional medicine finds it before it goes wrong. And uh, so I went down a long road of functional medicine, 
it's it's it should be accessible. What to does it everyone. do? Does it find out what you're lacking? Uh, yes. Dietary. So, yeah. Um, finds out what you're lacking, but they'll also like. <laughs> I've done stool tests, I've done saliva tests, urine tests. Remember, like, at one stage, the courier would be coming in your hand in a box <laughs> and there's stool samples inside and mm. he's no idea. Um, but, yeah, I would have found out an awful lot through that. And also I would have done functional medicine for when I was sick, like with the fibromyalgia. I wouldn't be, like, at one stage I wasn't, I would have struggled to walk up the stairs in my house. Um, that's not those things don't that's not an issue anymore so one thing um that um one thing that came up when I was doing the functional medicine testing you've heard heard of heavy metal toxicity yeah. here so I tested really 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 high for what's the metal that's in uh mercury no no god my brain's gone but uh, I can't remember the name of it now. It was in old paint and it was in pipes and old houses and stuff. You sure it wasn't lead? Lead. Did you say lead? Yeah. Sorry. And um, I think if you're, I, 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 from what I remember, it should be about four. Mine was 41. And uh, so we didn't know. Like, Where were you picking that up? Don't know. Household at home is old. So that's all we could think of at the time. And... Uh, so did a detox uh, through this functional medicine doctor, um, taking different things like colloidal silver and chlorella and, and other things to try to pull the heavy metals from my cells. And I uh, got it down to, I think, 14 when I retested from what I remember. This is about 10 years ago. And uh, when I was 23, my lovely, uh, crazy ex-boyfriend made a comment one day about uh, a girl down the road and said, well, at least she's got a pair of tits. And one, I'm not one to be beaten. So I went into work the next day, rang around cosmetic surgeons and booked myself in to get breast implants. This is 20... The very next day? The next day. I had thought about it before. I had thought about it. And um, so, yeah, I made an appointment and went and got them done. So I a never. Sore. Um, No, not overly. No, I suppose you're painkillers and stuff. It was work. I mean, I'll get to the rest of the story. Right. So um, I got them in 23, I think it was. And um, I was never felt, I couldn't think about them because they made me feel actually physically they made me feel nauseous because the thought of something in my body that shouldn't be, that just made, just... In the back of your mind, that's what Yeah, freaked me out. So all those years later, um, I kind of thought, I wonder are these making me sick? And uh, I went to the GP and I asked him, could I go and get an MRI scan to make sure they weren't um, leaking or anything? Had an MRI scan, they said everything's intact. So... Um, Thought, well, obviously it's not them, sure they're fine. And um, then I came across an article actually by Crystal Hefner, Hugh Hefner's wife. Of course. Yeah. So she had an illness called, they call it breast implant illness. So she was saying how she had all these symptoms and she, uh, when she got her implants out, basically her health improved dramatically. So then I found this group, she she talked in the article about this group on on Facebook in America Breast implant illness, I can't remember the name of it. And uh, for women, obviously. And uh, I went on there and through there I found a group in the UK and Ireland and I joined that. And uh, everyone's like, it was all the very same symptoms, chronic pain, chronic fatigue, um, anxiety, digestive problems, like weakened immunity, like endless stuff. So I rang around in Ireland to find, to, to get them removed. And, uh, but I'd learned through this, um, through researching myself and books to get them out, you have to get them out properly. And when you get implants put in or anything put in your body, your body sees it as an invader. So it's constantly fighting against it. So hence where your immune system and everything can be affected, no energy, all those things. And, uh, your body forms this capsule around them. We have photographs on my phone if you want to see them. 
and uh, your body forms this capsule around it and that's containing everything in that capsule. So to actually do it correctly, you have to get the capsule and the implant all out intact in one. In Ireland, your what, body creates the capsule. A capsule around it, yeah. So it's to try and keep you safe from this foreign invader. So and is that like scar tissue? Yeah, it's um, like it's a soft substance. Um, it's not like a hardened substance, but it's it. Yeah, I imagine it is like a scar tissue in that it's it's there for mm. protection. So you have to get it all out intact, and any place that I rang back then in Ireland they weren't doing that they were just opening you up slitting open the capsule taking out the implant maybe not even removing the capsule or not making sure it's all gone anyway so I went to the UK I went to a guy in Birmingham and got them out and before the operation I actually wrote down all my symptoms and uh, if I was I know that if I was to find that diary and look back that sure I, I just know like I feel so much better from taking them out of my body. And and this is my thing with Botox as well. I just feel really sad for people with the amount of stuff they're putting into their faces and their bodies for aesthetic purposes. People can get addicted to it, though, don't they? Totally. It, yeah. it is scar tissue, yeah. 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 That's, that's crazy. Yeah. And, and, it, that an, in, and nobody's talking about it and nobody's talking about Botox. And... <clears throat> You know, in that sense, I, I am starting to see and hear and like loads of clients will say to me, they'll come in, they go, I know that you're really against Botox and I'm going, I'm like each to your own, like, but, and I'm not, you know, if some of my clients do get it, um, and they're nearly afraid to tell me, um, but I, I just, A, I find it really sad that people want to, they're so insecure, um, because where does it stop, mm. you know? And uh, as you say, it's addictive. And also, when when do you start to accept yourself? At what age? You know? The hardest thing people have to do is accept themselves, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. We're always harder on ourselves. Oh, yeah. I remember listening to a Jordan Peterson book and he had this great thing about uh, if you have a pet. Mm. And you don't even have to have kids to be like this. You know, you could be a young person with a pet. And if your pet is sick, you take it to the vet. And they say, make sure this gets this tablet in its food every day. And you be putting it into sausages. And you, and if you're sick yourself, you take that. Yeah. You wouldn't finish a course. You wouldn't go do anything. Yeah. And would you, ha are you accepting of yourself now? Um, I think so. Yeah. I, I yeah. Are you I, married? No. Kids? You can put a shout out. I'm looking for a husband. <laughs> <laughs> um, no kids. Would you like to? Have kids? Hmm. God, no. no. Sorry, I don't. <laughs> don't a, client, a client yesterday said to me, <laughs> Belinda, would different. you like to get married? And I was, like, and my reaction was like almost panic. It was like, and I said, I actually feel like claustrophobic inside when you say that, um, which was funny. But um, I never really had that wanting to get married, have kids. Never. Would you think... Um, Having gone through a relationship like that, it put you off it? Yeah, for sure. I I think I've, I always remember my mom telling me that she had this visitor in the house one day who was very prim and proper and I was about seven or eight. She asked me to do something and I seemingly said, don't you ever tell me what to do. So I think I've always had that, um, just that need for freedom. And it's not that a relationship you know that you're going to be tied down and don't have freedom but you do have to you know you do have to take someone else obviously into consideration mm. and I'm I'm single so long that you know I've had bits and pieces of mm. relationships but um yeah I think I would really struggle now but then maybe if I met the right person mm. if he exists my dad always said if there was a weirdo between here and Malin Head I'd you'd find, find him. him yeah <laughs> Weirdo magnet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any weirdos out there, contact Belinda on. <laughs> yeah. No crazies. <laughs> uh, everyone's a bit crazy though, aren't they? I just mean no crazies is in like the ex crazy. Oh, well, no one. No, that's, <laughs> that's on the other end of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Yeah. And when, so your typical day now, right? You get up in the morning, you go into work and people come in. Would you have mostly repeat customers or would it be someone new every day that's coming to you um no i'd have predominantly repeat because um my clients are coming to me a long time so i'm generally booked up with 
like people that I know. What is the most common skin condition people suffer with? Well, when I started the business, it was rosacea, which is like a, a redness and inflammation in the skin. Uh, acne, we see a huge amount of acne. We got a, we've got a lot of teenage boys coming at the minute. and uh, But now, um, eczema, rashes, psoriasis, all since COVID. Um, really? True to roof. heard it here first. Like it's crazy. And I, I suppose, um, I don't know whether it's stress. I don't know whether it's the vaccine. I don't know like what's, where it's coming from. I don't know are people more stressed now than pre-COVID. I think people are more stressed now. Yeah. And like psoriasis has gone through the roof, which is not immune disease. And um, as well, people can't get to, like sure, you know, you can't get to, um, to access anybody in, in the medical system or it's very difficult. So I believe it's like two or three years to get to a dermatologist seemingly now. Um, now maybe that's if you don't have private health insurance. So we're just inundated with stuff, uh, with calls and emails constantly with rashes and yeah. But it's in a, the country's really weird now. Everything's got so expensive. Yeah. Like I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm able to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. But Going shopping, even going to the town and getting some food, getting, you know, a takeaway, yeah. paying your bills, paying for insurance, tax. I don't know how people are doing it. And everyone has to work harder. And there's just this bad vibe in the air, you know, with the government and with the immigrants and mm. the war. And like, there's this just bad energy. There's yeah. bad energy out there. But uh, it like, for change to come, uh, things have to get uncomfortable, mm. you know, and things are really uncomfortable now. So I think it's a really anxious time and it's hard to stay grounded and like going back to the farm, like for me going up there is, is somewhere that I can really ground. Um, yeah, I, I, I think things will get better, but they have to get maybe a little bit worse before they get better. God, when they, if they maybe get worse, not, they will get worse. Maybe not worse, but I think you have to get to a point of just, yeah of kind of maybe switching off from it all because like that, like I watch Morris and, you know, he's he's fighting the fight, but I couldn't fight that fight because that would kill me. Like that, the the amount of anxiety and, and to believe that from my greatest saying is everything is exactly as it's meant to be um, because without acceptance of, without acceptance, that's where you really, really suffer, no matter what it is, mm. you know, so... Um, I, I love the information that Morris has and, and agree with what he's saying, but, and I, and pe we need people like him. Um, but some, like it, that would cripple me. I, I couldn't, um, I have to just take myself away from it all and just believe well, that's in the, the process. That's the problem with democracy now. Mm -hmm. So democracy was set up so we could elect people to be the Morrises. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a volume of people that elect people to fight the good fight for you, yeah. for the best of the people. Mm -hmm. And now it's just a career job mm -hmm. for people, you know, and the wrong people get into politics because of the way everyone's set up. Yeah. And it just makes everyone, like, I'd love a good leader. Would you like, do you care even? See, that's terrible. The, most people don't care. They don't care. They don't want to vote because they look at these people and they're just, I don't believe that you say. But I think like that, because people have lost faith, like mm. they're all one and the same. And I think that's the problem. Yeah, I'm pure just now. My bubble is my bubble. And that's all I'm fucking worried about. And outside of that, everything can fuck off. I, I know. But yeah. and the problem is that a society won't grow. or We can't push forward in the future if we don't as a group look forward. No, absolutely. I I am a problem by not. <laughs> like, I am a problem. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> well, no, but, like, for everyone. Like. If everybody had the same mentality as me, we're never going to get anywhere. We're never mm. going to do anything. But I, so I do understand I am the problem, but I used to care. I don't anymore. Like the past had its problems, you know, it did. But people looked forward. They mm -hmm. looked up, they built stuff that they'd never enjoy themselves. You know, and the best men plant trees that they'll never see the shade of. You know, so, but, but it is like, it's, it, we don't build anything. We don't do anything just to do it and to show what humanity is about. And mm. we don't want to work together. Everyone's against each other and everyone's yeah. polarized and it's unhealthy. It's mm. unhealthy for our species. Yeah. I ask, I but questions. I don't know where that's going to like, again, you can get caught up in that or you can, uh, 
Everyone gets nervous when I get the question, though. Oh, no. You ready? I have face age, you know. Do you? I did. It's coming back a bit now. I know where it's from. Stress. That's all. Uh, what do you, what do you um, wash your face with? A uh, six-in-one shampoo. <laughs> yeah, there's your problem. <laughs> really? Well, your skin is a barrier, so when you use stuff on it, you told me before that you were, I don't know what you said you're using on it, and it just went, sure, no wonder your skin is falling apart. Oh, I'd, whatever was in the the thing that I, whatever's there, I just use. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. You get away with it for so long. And then, like you say, stress coming from the inside and then shit products on your skin on the outside. Vicky was trying to get me to, she was putting this stuff on my face every night. She was like, put it on, come on, just, just put it on. It's only going to take a minute. And I was like, oh, it makes me feel all gooey. And I, I don't, I didn't, you know. The maybe. next time you're down with Boland's, call in and we'll get you under the I'll have LED. to. I'll have to go down, uh, but I won't be going down to Boland's. <laughs> <laughs> What's your first vivid childhood memory? Um, my memory is really crap. And I was thinking about this question. Um, and the earliest one that I can actually kind of come up with is, do you remember those fart bombs? Is that what they were called? Yeah. They were like a little glass bottle. Yeah. And if when you broke it, threw it on the ground, there was liquid inside and it was stinky. Awful. Um, my brother had those and I took one and I, ha I remember I was in school in maybe first class this and I was, why they didn't like her in school. This is, <laughs> this is the reason. I was coloring in, but I had stuck it in the top of the marker. So when I was coloring, it went flying out across onto the floor and smashed. And they did like me, the teachers didn't, but the class did because we got out of class for the day. That's that was cool. actually my, that, at least. yeah. That's cool. It's a different one, isn't it? Uh, what's the most painful thing you've ever been told? Um, my dad, I guess, that dad had had a stroke. Yeah. Did you wake him at home? No. I'm going, where did we wake him? <laughs> no, we didn't. We waked him in a funeral home down the road. Um, if you could make one phone call to heaven, who would you call? My dad. What would you say to him? Um, I bought a car off Boland's, I'm sorry. <laughs> He'd be raging with you. <laughs> he would. <laughs> Is home for you a place for a feeling? Feeling. If your life was a movie, which scene would you play over and over? If your life was a movie, which scene in my life? Hmm. When I'm up the fields. What do you do up the fields? Just walk around being weird, talking to things that won't talk back. Has that never talked back? Not yet. Well, not in words. Do you ever do mushrooms? No. Why? Just no interest. Get on that shit. <laughs> <laughs> What's something that you're holding on to that you need to let go? Um... Probably waiting for, um, probably waiting for somebody to say, God, well done, I'm proud of you. Has no one told you that? Yeah, but like even now with the, the farm thing, how much resistance you get rather than, I, I find it really weird that people don't just go, Jesus, well done. You know, instead of ridiculing you, I find that so strange. I know, like, it happens with everybody. It's not just me. But I find that really odd that people are like that rather than encouraging somebody. Maybe you're talking to the wrong people. Yeah. Yeah, that's been said. No, if you if you had probably, um, like, just say you uh, were married and had kids, it would all be like, well done, ma'am. Because <laughs> 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 you get put them to bed and get in trouble if they don't. They're terrified of you. Uh, who brings you the most happiness in your life? Um, Don't say yourself, you can't say yourself. Oh, that was my first answer. I know, and that's a good answer. But for this, I need someone else. Um, my uh, ex-boyfriend, who's my best friend. Yeah. How does that work? Sure, we're just like brother and sister. We're just, yeah, we've great crack. 
what happens if he gets a woman married and she goes, I don't want you hanging with her anymore. She's real successful. She drives a Merc. No. We'll have to cross that bridge. <laughs> <laughs> when you get to it. Yeah. I think it's really difficult for um, for lads that say, if you're a stay-at-home man. Yeah. It must be very lonely. It'd be lonely to be a stay-at-home father than it would be for a woman. Why? Because just because I dropped the kids in mm. school and stuff, I can imagine that if you're at home and you drop the kids and you can see that when the ladies drop their kids to school, they have a little community and they can go off and go for coffee. And you know, could you imagine being a land going, oh, how was your day today? <laughs> well, you know, Mary down the road, she's so nice. We went for a coffee and it, it wouldn't be the same. It'd be weird. Yeah, maybe. But uh, like there's more lads though now that would be, that maybe would, no? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, that, that's just me. I could be wrong. I, I, I mostly am. The other day I tried to record a podcast and I didn't even press the <laughs> God. Do you believe in God? Uh, not a God, no. What God? Uh, I just believe in like an energy rather than a God. I don't believe, I think it's easy to just say God, but it really it's it's more an energy. Like nature, <laughs> for one, not wanting to sound tacky um, or cliche, like I would see nature as my God. Um, yeah. Do you believe that um, animals and plants have a consciousness? A hundred percent. Trees. Like my Instagram page is full of trees. <laughs> Um, yeah. Do you know they've actually proven that plants and trees all connected and they have like, like a human brain, that they're all connected by mushrooms and funguses and they all talk to each other. All and underground. Yeah. 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 Like that's mad. I was watching, uh, what was that movie? Avatar. And you know in the film Avatar, they say the whole forests are connected and they talk to each other to... Mother, fucking, I can't yeah. remember what the the mother earth was, or, but now they prove that it's actually true that they actually can talk to each other. And if one tree gets a disease, that they tell it, and they, it's mad. Yeah, stuff. but the, why is it mad? Like when we think of it, like when we say we believe in aliens because we'd be fucking stupid to think that we're the only mm. things that exist. So why is it mad? It's mad, but because like we can do it, we were built to do it. So why wouldn't anything else be built to do it? Built to do what? Like that we can communicate with each other and fix each other and help each other. And yeah, I know, but it's to to think that they're connected in a forest and by other animals or in other species, you know, are just one big organism. You know, we you look at a tree as a tree, a mushroom is a mushroom, and this is a that, but they're all connected right with each other, talking to each other. But, you know, so are we. Like, and it's just the problem is that we've, um, we think we're separate from nature. And... Like, do you ever hear the thing that they used to say, you know, that years ago people didn't have toilets in their house. So they used to go to the loo outside mm. and they would say that the land will actually read your urine and grow what it is that your body needs. Oh, that's really interesting. So like Isn't we're it? so we're so connected, but but we're not anymore. And that's the problem. And even like when when I was up with Brendan there a couple of weeks ago on his farm and he was talking about social farming. And I think like, be it, you know, to get kids out on land or people that suffer with mental health out on land, it's just like, because we are connected and we've lost that connection. And I think that's a big problem with, like we're all running around so busy and you, you know yourself, you go for a walk in the woods, you just feel so much better. Towards if you sit down and watch Netflix, you won't get, mm. you, you might relax, but you're not fully relaxed. You won't get the same benefit that you will if you go out in nature. So I think that we forget we are connected. Nature is connected and we're connected to nature, but that's been lost. Mm. But I think it's coming back. Yeah, it's coming back to a certain extent. But I, I don't know. Sometimes I do think that we're going to have to do an Elon, Elon Musk on it and merge with AI. Move into the stars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on too much science fiction trip uh, at work, I think. Mm -hmm. What do you think happens when you die? Um... I believe in reincarnation. So, um, yeah, like, you know, even when my dad died, um, I I didn't want to be, I, I felt that 
he's on his journey going wherever he was going. So I didn't want to even be, this might sound very strange, I didn't even want to be too sad. Like, like sad is fine, but I didn't want to be too upset. And I, I felt that, I feel that when somebody dies, they're, yes, they're gone physically, but they're still a, a little bit around. And I didn't want to stop his journey. So even when he was actually dying, um, I remember myself and my sister um, went out for, she was smoking at the time, we went out for a cigarette. And I was saying to her, you know, don't be crying. Try not to be crying, which is which is a bad thing to be saying to someone in mm. hindsight. But I was like, don't let dad know that you're upset because it'll be harder for him to leave. It's his time now and, and he needs to go on his journey. So I... I suppose I, I believe that we move into the next phase, whatever it is. But I do believe in reincarnation. But like even uh, I moved into my family home last March, a year ago. And, you know, it's last year was tough with my mom going to the nursing home and stuff. And uh, there's a light in the sitting room, a lamp in the corner of the sitting room. And I have a cat at home and everyone says, oh, did the cat, you know, is the cat near it? Mm. That turns on when I'm not in a good place. I'll and walk in and it's on. So when she had her, when she had the stroke and she was in hospital and I was, it was during the summer and I was watering her flowers one day and I just outside the sitting room window and I looked in and the light was on. I hadn't been in there. Um, and it does, it hasn't been on now in a while. Um, but yeah, it comes on randomly. Ghosts. Um, I, like I've had, um, uh, white witch in the house and she I know my my grandmother's there and uh, and I feel yeah that dad kind of comes and goes as needed so I, I really believe that lamp is him not that he's the lamp but not that he's reincarnated mm. as a light but that he you know that, that that's there what do you think you are in a past life any ideas um I definitely think I was um uh, burnt or not burnt at stake, but fuck <laughs> I'm go- me. I'm, I'm going to be it's fucking heavy for a Sunday morning. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> with the way things are going, and what I want to do with the land, I feel like I'm going to be burnt at stake again. Um, I feel like I was a witch in one life. You know, one of the not in Salem, but I don't know where. Um, something to do with yeah, or being buried alive or something. Um, fucking hell, very live. Yeah. Other than that. I don't know. What do you think is next for you in the next life? God, I don't know. Um, I have no idea. Would you like to live forever? No, absolutely not. No. Life is hard, it's, you know, and, and I see being here as, you know, you're trying to learn the lessons mm. and you're working towards something so that in the next life you're coming back. I, I suppose I have a bit of the the Buddhist philosophy um, of that you're you're kind of working towards that enlightenment, so that in each life you're trying to learn those lessons and get closer to that place, whatever that place is. I don't know. Um, so it's trying to 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 be here and observe and learn. Um, yeah. You're gonna love this question. When was the last time you shit yourself? Ne- I never as a baby. Girls don't do stuff no, like that. No, girls don't do stuff <laughs> like that. Juan, <laughs> <laughs> tell us more. <laughs> Linda, thanks a million for coming up. Thanks for having me. One more thing. Do you have a motorbike? I'm collecting it tomorrow. What kind? It's a Honda Rebel um, 500. I'm going to see it. Honda Rebel 500? It's very cool. It's matte black. And Is this uh, your first one? It's my first bike. I always wanted to have a bike and I just did lessons there uh, earlier this year. That, that's what they're doing. Oh my dear God. See the bigger picture on the right there? Yeah. Well, mine is matte black. Nice. That's very impressive. Yeah. That's t- two Wexicans in a row. <laughs> Fair play to you. I tell you, the, the, I know you're, the whole car thing, you might be failing a bit, but by God, you're failing it on the bikes. I'm failing on the car? No, not you. Oh. Wexford. Wexford. Oh, sorry. You have to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> you bought me a t-shirt, for God's sake. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Are you nervous on the bike? 
Oh, uh, like when you're doing lessons, um, when I inquired about lessons, actually, it's like 16 hours and you do it over two days. That's the way they want you to do it. So I find it hard to learn that way. I, I lose concentration. So I found female instructor and we did it like three hours at a time, two and a half hours. So I've only been on the road twice with it. Um, so there'll be a lot of hopping. Well, I would love to be in your little business while Mary down the road comes in for her fucking facial, right? And next thing, <laughs> you come par- into the parking lot. She won't know what to think. No, she won't. <laughs> That's brilliant. Belinda, thanks a million for coming. Thank you. Thanks we'll for have little me. links and you can follow her and it's um it's cool. You pop some nice pictures. Oh, thank you. Very cool. Thanks. Especially trees. Especially when I'm cutting them down. Trees and churches. Feel, when you said guilty. I was coming into a, a church uh, a park, car yeah. park, I was like, cool. Yeah, I'll have to have a look right, in the church now when I'm they're here. They're doing motorbike lessons just down there. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Med for you. Right. Belinda, thank thanks a million. Thank you. Thanks a million. Hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, remember, if you want to support the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash Deadwood from the trees. And uh, yeah, I'll see you again next week.